joining us, and I mean that with all my heart. It's just wonderful. As I mean, sure, as, as Paul was expressing, the great privilege we have to be able to gather together amongst God's people, knowing in God's presence. And uh, that, that combination, God's people knowing that God is present means God is, and we believe, don't we, that God is always at work, don't we? God is always doing something. And so we can trust and we can believe this morning that God will be doing something in our hearts through his word. And that's the promise and that's the purpose, I believe, of gathering together, certainly um, along with the edification of the saints one to another, and allowing the, the, allowing the, uh, the spirit of God through the giftings to be able to just to build up the body of Christ. And so uh, it's great to be together. Um, I'm going to jump straight in because I know we're going to be, we're going to be, um, I've got territory I want to cover this morning and I just don't think I'm going to get there, but that's fine. So let's, if you're a visitor this morning, um, we are in the book of Romans, so if you will turn with me to, and we have spent the last um, oh, four or no, five weeks, I think, in the first chapter, uh, so we're still there, so um, let's go to Romans chapter one. And uh, as you turn there, I want to remind you, actually, I want to invite you next Sunday morning after the service, um, um, we have a baptism um, plan. Uh, Lord willing, we will all gather down the, the beach and Mariah, are you here, Mariah? Yeah. Uh, I met you coming in. She was here. Hi, Mariah. She's out there? All right, she uh, is uh, going to be baptized, so... If you can come uh, prepare yourself to, after the service, make your way down to the beach and, uh, and, uh, <laughs> what did I do wrong? It's Sunday. Oh, I've got to talk to Mariah about that. Uh, what's, what's more important, getting baptised or Kari? Kari. Kari's going to get baptised. Yeah. 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 Kari and baptism, All right, we'll have a look at it and, uh, Kari and baptism. That sounds all right. That's Okay, so you good with that? I hope that made some sense. Um, okay, so last uh, last week we were in Romans, and um, can, I make, can I can I request that we turn that? Yeah, I'm trying. Trying. That's really I'm trying. <laughs> That's right. My old eyes. Oh, don't do that. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's good. That's good. You can leave your light on. You want me to go this way? You want me to go this way? You want me to get a tan? Yeah. We'll, we'll get there. All right, enough from Holiday. Let's get on with this. Last week in Romans, we saw how Paul was unfolding what we have called the downward spiral towards unbelief. This is a, this is a, a challenging chapter, but it's one that we dare not ignore. And so he began, uh, where we began with him in this portion in verse 21. So if you'll just read that with me, I've got to take you back a little bit so we can go forward. Um, where it says in verse 21, he says, because although, after having talked about, remember from the weeks before, after having talked about the wrath of God, um, and prior to that, <laughs> the, the righteousness of God being unveiled, he moved on, and last week we saw in verse 21, he says, because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened, professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. And what this says, again, as we looked at this last week, what this says is that human history is not the story of primitive Man or primitives worshipping animals and all types of idols who never knew the true and the living God or never heard of 
God, the God of the heavens and the earth and never understood who he really is to then go from that, not having known God, to then slowly evolve into man who worships the true and the living God. History, that is not mankind's story. That's not history. The opposite is true. Because how was man created? Man was created in the image of God. And man began his journey on this planet in, in the fellowship with God. And the perversion of that truth of God began when mankind began to not honor him as God. And it's very important that we recognize this truth. Because the moment, this is for you and I, the moment that we do not honor God as the only majestic, all-powerful, and infinitely greater one than ourselves, the moment we do not understand God in that capacity, that's the moment we began the downward spiral. And that's what's happened in human history. And we who were created to worship God will begin to worship lesser gods, lesser Things. And so Paul describing, it's getting more fun, isn't it? So Paul describing the very, real, the very real danger of allowing yourself, ourselves, to lose sight of the overwhelming awesomeness of the glory of God and who He is. So don't fall, brothers and sisters, don't fall into the trap of approaching God in casual terms. It's a real danger in our society, isn't it, within the church? He's not the guy, he's not the man upstairs. Never approach God like that. He's not simply your best friend. Never approach God like that. No, he is God. He is the sovereign Lord of the universe, the creator of heaven and earth. All things are held by him in his hand. He, he holds the very physical universe together. He is the God who brought it all into being. He is the God who, can, who contains it and strains it and keeps it. And he is the God who will one day allow it to come to an end. That's the God who we worship before he creates a new heavens and a new earth and brings into existence the new heaven and the new earth. That's who God is. That's his agenda. And we dare not divest God of his divinity with such sentimental approaches like the man upstairs or my best friend who's the one who never leaves me, he walks me. Well, those things may be true. They may be true. Never lose sight. This is God, King David. Describing God says in Psalm 93, the Lord reigns. He is. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed with strength. He goes on to say, Lord, your throne is established of old. You are from everlasting unto everlasting. He continues on in Psalm 47. You, can, you, you read this from the heart of David, the man after God's own heart. He says, God sits upon the throne of his holiness as he reigns over all men. He's not just a buddy, is he? He's not just that man upstairs. So never lose sight of God's holiness and his magnificence. In humility, we must always show great reverence to the Lord and to his name. And to his name. Remember, Paul here is giving warning, declaring that God's wrath was being, or is being, continues to be, always has been, been revealed from heavens against all ungodliness and unrighteousness, as it says there, of people who do what? Who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The truth that people suppress and reject is that he is the one true God and that he should be honored and he should be worshiped and he should always be esteemed as God. So the journey to unbelief, we can go back to the Garden of Eden and we can see where it started and we can see it throughout the history of mankind. We can see throughout the nation of Israel and certainly throughout the church age. The journey to unbelief begins with the suppression, the rejection and the reduction of who God is. That's where it starts. And so now Paul is continuing in this warning by identifying what the consequences of the rejection of honoring God as God will be. And what ultimately 
Paul pictures or draws a picture, if you will, of this tragic end where mankind is lowering himself below the condition that God created him to be, created us to be. We'll read those verses in a moment. So Paul said, mankind from the very beginning, from the very beginning should become aware of the consciousness of God. How? Remember we looked at this last week? Through the creation. But again, they chose to suppress that truth. And so rather than opening, we can see this up in mankind, rather than opening himself up to the reality of the existence of such a glorious God, a glorious God of intelligence, design and purpose, which is evident throughout the creation. And so rather than opening themselves up to it, they closed their hearts to it. And Paul says their foolish hearts were darkened to the truth and having rejected God, man now exalts not God, but who? Man now exalts himself. Man now has rejected the knowledge of who God is and now exalts the knowledge of himself. We were created by God we know this. We were created by God to live a God-centric existence, a God-centered existence, which for you and I as Christians means putting God first and allowing every activity in life to flow from the premise that God is the one who sets the priorities of life. God is the one. And so we have confidence in this God. This is what it is to have a God-centric, a God-centered life. We have confidence in God. We are dependent upon Him and all of His abilities to be able to provide for us every step of the way. We believe that God is with us, don't we? We believe that He will never leave nor forsake us, don't we? We believe He will provide all our needs according to His riches and glory, don't we? We believe it. This is what it is to have a God-centric, God-centered life. It's on his abilities, it's on his provision. Life is focused on him and all of his activity, his purposes. Therefore, we come to him in humility before this God. We deny self. We deny ourselves. We seek first the kingdom of God and what? And his righteousness. We always seek after. This is very important, this last statement. We always seek after God's perspectives in every circumstance of life, in that holy living, in that holy, godly living. That's a God-centric life. That's how God has created us to live. That's where ultimate fulfillment and purpose is going to be realized. That's where your peace is going to be discovered. In knowing that and understanding that relationship, but the opposite of that the opposite of that is maintaining a self-centered, right, perspective. A self-centered perspective with whose priorities? With my priorities at the top. Set and to serve my own desires. So how does life like that look? Well, life simply looks like it is self-focused, doesn't it? You know, we are proud of ourselves. You hear this mantra in society, don't you? We are proud of ourselves. We are proud of our own accomplishments. We have confidence in ourselves. And we become dependent upon ourselves. And we're dependent upon our own abilities. And we are seeking, ultimately, acceptance not from the God of heaven and earth, but ultimately we are seeking acceptance from the world and its ways apart from God's purpose in our lives. It's called selfish living. That's, a, that's the opposite. That's a self-centered, a human-centered life. One is based upon the knowledge of God. The other is centered around rejecting God's knowledge or rejecting God's principles to do what? To pursue my very own. Paul says, Paul says that men have suppressed the knowledge of God and they have exalted their own knowledge. And verse 22 says, if you remember from last week, verse 22 says they have become fools. Man has grown harder and harder and, and, and they have become oh, darker 
and darker in our minds and our hearts until finally, and you see this, until finally there is no remembrance of the true and the living God of all. That's this downward spiral towards unbelief. Until there is no remembrance, no place for God in their hearts. This country is in a downward spiral towards unbelief. We have to realise that. And you know people, don't you, Christian? You know people that are in that same downward spiral moving towards unbelief. And what verse 24 begins to tell us is the very so that's where we're at, by the way. Verse 24 begins to tell us the very sobering reality that when we as an individual or we as a nation give up on the knowledge of God, God ultimately will give up on us. God will let us, some say, have our own way. The time will come. This terrifies me. This is the most terrifying thought in this entire epistle. The time will come when he will give that individual, he will give that nation over to themselves. That's the shocking reality. God has forsaken those who have repeatedly forsaken him. And again, it's happened to nations. You can go throughout history. It's happened to nations. It's happened to cultures. It's occurred to countless individuals throughout the ages. And I'll say it again. It's happening to people right now. Right now. So let's read these verses, verse 24. I'm not going to get to the end of the chapter. It says, Now therefore God also gave them up. So I've given you the backdrop. So he says, Now therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness. Here's the symptoms of it. In their lust of their hearts to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves, who exchanged the truth of God for the lie, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. <coughs> Someone wrote this. At a point known only to God, this rejection of him inevitably leads to divine abandonment. And that's what Paul is describing, divine abandonment. You know? But this is more than, I know I sound like I'm contradicting myself, but this is so much more than God simply saying, okay, you had your way. It's more than that. This abandonment of God turns them over, or turns individuals, turns the nations over to the devastating judgment of becoming further and further engrossed in their sin. And again, we see it, don't we? We see it over and over again in our society. We see it in every... Anyway, we see it. Put it this way, I'll put it this way. God allows... God allows men and women to go as far as they desire for themselves by removing or restraining His influence or the influence of His grace that it previously placed upon them. He stops drawing the one that has constantly rejected him. And there is a sense of what he's saying is he stops drawing the stops drawing the one that has constantly rejected him to now cast him off in the direction that he's chosen. That's heavy, isn't it? That's really, really, really heavy. So it's so much more than God simply saying, okay, you have your way. See, what we have to remember is the context of the passage. In previous weeks, he has been expressing the wrath of God. Remember from verse 18? The wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and against all unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So again, as we saw previously, God's wrath, this is the context of it, God's wrath is not God blowing his stack, right? It's not God blowing his stack. It's not God indiscriminately annihilating anybody that gets in his way. No, God's wrath is always pictured as settled, determined, purposeful. It's the settled, determined, purposeful response of a righteous God against sin. It's the st- 
steady and steadfast absolution, uh, sorry, not absolution, opposition to all that is evil. That's what the wrath of God is. God is. And so when God gives someone over to their sin, it's not simply cause and effect. It's not simply God saying, okay, you can have your way, but you better look out for the consequences that are coming. No, 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 no. This is the outworking of God's personal decision to hand over a person or a nation unto their sin. It's God's purposeful wrath. You've got to understand that. Again, he withdraws his restraining and his protective hand, allowing the sins of the people to take their inevitable, destructive course, and God is purposefully involved in that. So he describes this downward spiral. Therefore God also gave them up to uncleanliness in their lusts, in the lust of their hearts, to dishonor their bodies amongst themselves. He gave them up to uncleanliness. He gave them up to impurities in the lust of their hearts. And he's talking about a lust. You know, we understand lust, right? He's talking about lust that grips a person's heart, that grips a nation's heart. And he's speaking about the strong craving for the things that are impure. And, and, and ultimately here he's talking about impurity of sexual sin. And, a God, and again, God handing them over to these impure lusts, it speaks of this downward descending from bad to worse. They picture, Paul is picturing a society that is plummeting lower and lower and lower, plummeting downward, downward, Edward, downward into sexual immorality. And it comes, and you know, oh, do I want to describe this? No, I don't. But what he does do, the, the words that he's using here, the language that he's using here, it covers every filthy sexual act from pornography to adultery to bestiality and so many other things that are simply simply unmentionable here today. Things that our society, what you will notice if you stop and you look and your eyes are open, what you will notice is that our society is in a very real sense gradually, gradually making these things <coughs> called pictures as a downward plummeting to destruction our society is cleaning them up, right? Our society is making them acceptable. But do you notice what he also said there? He also said that these things dishonor their bodies amongst themselves. Sexual sin, dishonoring their bodies amongst themselves. Shameful things, he says there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and verse 18, it says there that we should flee sexual immorality. He says this, every sin that man does is outside of the body. Please hear this. But he who commits sexual morality sins against his own body. Proverbs chapter 6 and verse 7 is talking about sexual immorality. Ask the question, can a man take fire into his bosom and not be burned? It's a rhetorical question. Of course, the answer is no, of course he can't. All sexual sin is self-damaging. It destroys the person involved like no other sin does. It's almost got its own category. That's why we get so much attention given to it, and that's why there's such an identifying mark of a society that is in an out-of-control downward spiral. It destroys people like no other sin. And here... This is describing those that refuse God's standard. We know God is holy, isn't it? We serve a holy God, a righteous God. But it's describing those that refuse God's standard, again, as descending into this, this cesspool of iniquity. Do you agree with me? Free fall out there, isn't it? It's, it's in free fall. We are in a descent into unrestrained immorality. Just look. Just look at it. No, don't do it. No, don't. 
But you all see the ads for reality TV, don't you? You know, it started with putting a group of people in a house together and seeing what would happen, right? And now what are they doing? Now what are they doing? What's the latest one? There's a couple of people. They're taking couples and they're splitting them up. And they're putting them with other couples. Mm. And just waiting to see what's going to happen. And this is great entertainment. See what I mean? You know, our society is cleaning up, trying to make that which is evil look good. It's a sign, isn't it, that we really lost the knowledge of God. It's a sign that we're out of control. So it begins with immorality. We don't need to label for this like we already have, right? So it begins with immorality, and then he moves from immorality, he moves on to idolatry. Notice what he says there in verse 25. They are those who exchange the truth of God for a lie, and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Here's the thing. And you know this. You don't have to worship foreign gods. You, you don't have to set up an idol of, a, of uh, a polis in your backyard. You don't have to you know, do any of that. No, there's, there's plenty, isn't there? There's plenty of things that people are worshipping. What are they worshipping? There's affluence. There's materialism, there's status, there's ego, there's selfishness, there's you, there's self, there's the body beautiful. Oh, we're good at worshipping that, aren't we? You know, there's the body beautiful, there's careers, and I think we could just go on and on and on. There are gods of plenty in our society that people are worshipping every single day. He says what they have done, they have exchanged exchange the truth of God for the lie. And when he says exchange, the word exchange, he uses it three times in this, in this passage. He says they have taken something and they have willingly acknowledged and purposefully changed it for another truth. So they've looked at this, they've looked at what God has given us, they've said, no, this is not acceptable to our desires, to our passions, to our goals, to our knowledge. No, we want to get rid of that and we have exchanged it for all this other stuff. This filth. Exchanged it for immorality, have exchanged it for idolatry. He says they've exchanged the truth of God for definite, definite article, the lie. Again, they once had known the truth of God, and they have rejected that truth of Him, and they believed the lie, the lie being worship and serve the Creator, the creature rather than the Creator. Again, we go back to the garden, we see where it all started. So one immorality, one immorality, two idolatry, and now, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to come back next week. I will come back next week. But we're going to have to come back next week and finish this passage off. But notice this, just quickly, let me give you, because I think it deserves some time. Look at the third thing we read here. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged the natural use for what is against nature. Likewise, also the men leaving the natural use of the women burned in their lusts for one another, men with men committing what is shameful and receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due, even and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting. So God gave them over. Well, this is clear as... The day, isn't it? God gave them over to what is clearly destroying lesbianism and homosexuality. Now, I, I, don't, I don't want to even, maybe I will next week, because I'll have more time next week. But I don't want to go into the foolish arguments that people want to present or try to attempt to say that the scripture here is not addressing that sexual perversion and is described as sexual perversion. I'll save those for next week. I'll talk about those next week, but I'll come and we'll do that. But the interesting thing, let me say just a couple of really quick things. The interesting thing is that the scripture here does not use the normal words for man and woman when it talks about this. Because when you talk about a man, if I go, you know, Jim is a man, Donna is a woman, those 
those, those, those titles, if you will, really the, a man, a woman, there's dignity attached to that, isn't there? A woman, you know, a man. But what Paul does here is he changes, he doesn't use that, he goes male and female. He goes male and female. So rather than using the dignity of those personal terms, he uses these categories, male and female. And what he's doing, he's directly addressing the issue of the perversion of sexual orientation. How relevant is that for us today? You know? He is directly addressing the issue of the perversion of sexual orientation that God has ordained, that God has designed. So literally it says, female exchange the nature, so females exchange the natural use of what is against nature. Likewise, the males leaving the natural use of the females burn in their lust for one another, males with males committing what is shameful. Paul is clearly pointing, and again I'll come back to this, Paul is clearly pointing to the fact that God has an order in his created purposes. Isn't that right? And he's saying that man has given up on the knowledge of God, his man has given up on God, and God will ultimately give up on him because of that, because of man's choice. You know, when mankind begins to legislate, as our country has done, and many countries in the world have done, when mankind begins to legislate this perversion of God's divine order and purpose for mankind, you know what? We're in big trouble. We're in huge trouble. Because we're transgressing God's original design. You know? But let me say something. But Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount made it very clear that every single one of us is guilty of, guilty of transgressing God's mm. created original design yeah. for life, right? That's why we got saved, wasn't it? <laughs> you know? Every one of us, if you read the Sermon on the Mount, there is a purpose to the Sermon on the Mount, just as there is a purpose to the Book of Romans. The Sermon on the Mount was their purpose to indicate or bring man to the place of understanding that his righteousness will never do. There is only one righteousness. That's why he would say at the end, at, at midway through that sermon, be ye there perfect, even as your Father is perfect. You know, when Jesus said to the disciples, hey, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will no wise enter the kingdom of God. When they heard that, I was speaking too fast, slow me down, but right, when they heard that, that must have been a horrible thought to them. Because the Pharisees were, were seen to be as the, as the, the, the most righteous Practically righteous men in their society. Practically righteous. It's interesting. Chapter 1, here, Paul is dealing with the with the unrighteousness. When we get to chapter 2, Paul's going to be dealing with self-righteousness. And by the time we get to chapter 3, what Paul will have done is he will expose that all of humanity is guilty before God. Every single man, woman, and child ever born is guilty before God and needs a saviour. That's the purpose of this. So it's important that we understand this when we look at this passage and we don't suddenly go, okay, it's the gays. You know. No, 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 no. I think the church has, in many regards, drop a ball. You know. Because we are, well, let me pick this up next week. Let me pick this up next week. Look, look well, really quickly, you know, people will try to take these verses and say, no, you know, the Bible doesn't teach that homosexuality is a sin. But Genesis chapter 19, very clearly, when we talk about Sodom and Gomorrah, see that it is very relative to God's wrath being poured out upon that community. Leviticus chapter 18, Leviticus chapter 20, clearly says that there's sin in the eyes of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 9, there's a whole list of sins there that Paul brings, that, 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 that uh, Paul says uh, uh, evidence of those that will be outside the kingdom of God. I believe that's the passage that poor Israel Palau ended up in so much trouble over by quoting that scripture. Um, and of course, here we are in Romans, Apostle Paul identifying a nation or an individual that has given themselves up on God, and God likewise will ultimately give themselves up on him. This is God's... This is God's design. This is God's order. This is the knowledge of God that he, as I said to you, that he brought into existence for his people to know how to live life in his presence.
that to be all that God wants us to be. Can I leave it there with you? And can we pick it up and look at this subject with a little more detail next week? Can you recognize, can you recognize, if you read on further down, you will see that, you know, once Paul identifies this particular consequence, if you will, of rejecting the knowledge of God, you see the list that's there? Can you read on? Please read on. Because that list will hit every single one of us. Every single one of us. Because how wonderful it is. And by grace we are saved. Isn't that wonderful? Through faith, and that not of ourselves. Isn't that an amazing truth? You know, even the even the faith to believe in the grace of God is a gift of God. It's imparted to us. It's got nothing to do with us. It's His work. It's what He's doing in this world. It's a wonderful thing. And so, if you have been a recipient of that wonderful grace, you know, how dare we isolate a, 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 a piece of a, a, well, a, 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 I can't find the word. How dare we isolate? A segment of our society and say they are more wicked than other people. Yeah, because hey, because the church has that attitude, right? Yeah. Towards the homosexual in the community. Yeah. You know, we see it like that. You know, we almost have this, this perspective whereby we say, hey, you know, you guys have got to get it right and then you get saved. It's almost that attitude, isn't it? Yeah. You stop doing that and God will accept you. Did he say that to any of us? Did he say that to any of us that would speak liberality? Did he say that to any of us that were living in sin? Did he say that to any of us that were, were you know, willfully and purposefully living against what we knew to be true? He didn't say it to any of us, did he? He said, come, come, find forgiveness, find acceptance in God, and then God does the work. We say it all the time, love the sinner, hate the sin. Let's, let's love the sinners. Okay? Let's love them. Let's truly love them. Knowing that all men are sinners. Knowing that none is righteous, no one. Knowing that all have fallen short of the glory of God. Knowing that none saw God, not one, not one. But he drew us unto himself and he saved us by his grace and his love. It's the most glorious truth. Let's be praying, shall we? Yes. Okay. So let me bring it, so I will, I, I conclude here. I'm sorry to, to waffle like that a little bit, but this passage describes where we live today. You know, we don't have to go looking for it. It's all around us, but we've got to guard our hearts. Christian, you've got to guard your hearts, and you've got to remain pure. Guard your hearts with all diligence. Remember Proverbs chapter 4? Because from the heart proceeds the issues of life. Guard your heart. Fill it with the things of God. Pursue holiness. Pursue righteousness. Allow God to fill you and from your life will come those things. So guard your purity of what this, what this passage says to you and I. Guard your purity and then refuse to allow anything into your life that can usurp itself into a position where Christ should be sitting upon your heart. Isn't that right? That's what this passage says to you and I today. You know, I, I always say to young couples that are getting married, I say to them, you know, it's up to you, it's up to you to make sure that you do not allow any relationship into your lives and give it space to be able to usurp itself. We have that, we have that term, you know, we say, oh, I fell out of love. Well, they fell out of love. It's rubbish. It's rubbish. At some point, this is, this is applicable to our relationship with God. At some point, we see it in every marriage breakout. At some point, someone chose to stop loving someone here and chose to then start loving someone over here. They chose to stop investing here, but rather they began to invest here. And because they were investing here, the emotions and everything that goes with love was transferred from there over to here, and so now they're over here looking back there saying, oh, I feel out of love with that person, I feel in love with this person. No, you didn't. And the same thing applies to God. Put him first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And let, let God take care of everything else, you know. It's loving him. 
Pour yourself into him. Don't allow anything of this world to sneak into your life, to usurp that place upon the throne of your heart. It's Jesus and Jesus alone that sits there. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. And uh, uh, as the worship team, we want to finish with a full of worship with God one more time. Yeah? yeah? Let's end with worship. God bless you all. Thank you. Um, let's.